she teaches us Swahili when we go off. She reminds us how to do straight, clean Swahili. So without again taking any more time, allow me at this point, ladies and gentlemen, to welcome Bishop Dr. Langat. Let's put our hands together for Bishop Dr. Langat. Karibu Baba. Welcome. He literally picked me what you say from the mud to where <laughs> I am today. Welcome, Asko. Thank you. It's an honor to have you. Karibu Thank you. Sir. Thank you so much. So Thank, Thank you. Thank you. It's unbelievable. Karibu. Welcome. Thank you so much. Um, Reverend Meshak. Can I pray for you? Then you can continue. All right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Lord, this is like laughter for me. <laughs> I'm standing here with a man you used God to pick mm. me from the ashes. And uh, literally from the soil. And today I'm standing here with him. And um, may you bless him. And Father, you know his heart and the way he loves the people and the work mm. of God. And I pray, Father, that you can use him. Not by power, mm. not by might, mm. but by your spirit. Jesus. For, so, Lord, I commit the words of his lips and the word of God to come with power. And, Father, to make a difference. In the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Buana Asifiwe. Praise the Lord. It's a delight to be here this morning. What a blessing, it's actually almost uh, noon, uh, to be here with you all at uh, Upendo uh, Baptist Church, and what a delight to be reconnected with uh, my spiritual children. Uh, Misha and Catherine, as you've, you've heard, uh, come a long way with uh, me and my wife, uh, Jane, who's back home in Kenya. And, uh, and also, what a great joy also to meet the, the Bararas. Uh, I call Barar Bagule. We are age mates. I was asking him this morning where he lost his hair because <laughs> the last time we met, the, that kitchen was full of uh, hair. Um, but uh, Mishak, it is such a delight for you and a great honor for me and really indeed a privilege this weekend to be here in Dallas. The last time I was in Dallas, I was going through, I was a young man, single, very single, uh, 1992, December. I was at Asbury University as an exchange student, and uh, some young family took me home for Christmas. And uh, though we came back to the US for seven more years, I never came back to Dallas. And um, I just want to say briefly, my dear friends, uh, that you have a wonderful pastor. You have a wonderful pastor's family in the people of uh, Meshach and Catherine, together with their two little uh, daughters. I want to confess something I've never told anybody since they left us in December, that I tried my best put everybody get. You, this, if you've tested Meshach, you know what you have. And if you don't know what you have, you have heard it from Wenyewe, from himself, that you have the very best. So I tried my best to block every way, every excuse, and um, until my wonderful staff in the office who love Meshach, because he's a pastor to all of us, including the bishop. He comes to my house like midnight. And uh, that day, they organized um, a farewell. And I said, I'm not going to go. Can't go to this thing. I have tried my best. And uh, they came, both of them, to my office. You don't get to a bishop's office uh, as big of a church like Africa Gospel Church, and he cries like a baby. The day Meshach and Catherine left was not an easy time for me. And so I told them they are on leave. And I actually come to announce again that they are on leave. <laughs> that was the only way I could ex just um, console myself that let's allow these guys to take a leave somewhere in Dallas, some, I don't know, in the middle of nowhere, and they'll come back to us. But I think uh, I was zero on that day. Now I'm about 25%. If you get me back three more times, I'll get to 100% and accept that now you belong here. I, I am saying that to affirm 
the ministry of Reverend Meshach, and I want to appreciate uh, Reverend Shatrak uh, Ruto for welcoming them to this part of the world. I appreciate all of you for making them feel at home. Uh, they were not chased back home. I want you to know that. So love them, they will love you. I have already seen it this morning. Uh, he asked me to bring a message today uh, on family, so I'll try to see if I can do justice to this topic of family. I, I see a number of HEC congregations in Kenya are going through messages on family this month. I'll take us to a text in um, Psalm 92. It is my high school chaplain's text. And it's a text that has really been a blessing to me and has taken care of me from 1988 to where I am today. It's almost 35 years. That is Psalm 92, verse 12 to 15. My iPad did not pick the version, so no, just know that I'm reading from the Bible. Psalm 92, verse 12 to 15. The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon. Planted in the house of the Lord, they will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still bear fruit in old age. They will stay fresh and green, proclaiming the Lord is upright, he is my rock, and there is no wickedness in him. There are many scriptures that compare the righteous and their families as great trees. You will see scriptures that talk about the men and the women of God as a palm, as a seed of Lebanon, as vines and olives. Children are compared, I believe, in Psalm 128 to olive shoots around your table. They are painted as plants in the house of God by the rivers whose flourishing cuts across seasons. Here, towards the end of Psalm 92, we're given the picture of the righteous as a tree. Now, I'd like to use it, this text to bring us a message that I have titled Flourishing Families. And I have four subtopics that I want to share briefly, each one of them. Families of the people of God. Their place, their prosperity, and their proclamation. The people of God, you, you actually see two trees right there, the palm and a cedar, that is compared to the righteous or the people of God. The righteous are compared to those great trees in the Middle East. A Hebrew child would have understood very easily that kind of an identity. Charles Spichon, when he talks about, or when he talked about the palm tree, he said, when you see a palm tree, we see a noble palm standing, sending all its strength upward in one bold column and growing amidst the sand and the drought of the desert. We have a fine picture of the godly man who in his righteous aims alone at the glory of God and independent of outward circumstances, is made by divine grace to live and thrive where all things perish. And I know that as you live here in the diaspora, there are moments when you either are feeling you are alone as a righteous man or woman, or woman but also there are, in the opposite direction, moments when you feel like you are alone that no one cares about you and about your situation. Or maybe you and your little family feel like you are alone. So this palm tree, as you look at it in the middle of uh, uh, the desert, Charles Spigen has given us a very good picture of it. 
that it's like standing with mighty strength, towering and standing alone in the midst of sand and desert, and that it proclaims of a righteous man his uprightness and aims, who aims alone to glorify God. Then the cedar of Lebanon, you actually find in Psalm and across the Old Testament, the use of the language of the cedar of Lebanon. The cedar trees of Lebanon are often referred in the Old Testament. And they were known, again I'm quoting someone, they were known for their size, their strength, their durability, their beauty and usefulness. They were highly sought for in terms of construction. They were majestic, stable, durable, and could not easily rot like other trees. Actually, you know, uh, those of you who are Kalenjins, in our part of the world, like come from Bomet, they, they were round huts that were made out of the red, um, was it cedar? The, the, it could last even for 100 years. And when you remove the, everything else as rotten, you could still get it as intact as it was put in that soil 100 years ago, and you could use to rebuild the next mud hut. Those are the durable cedars of Lebanon. They were majestic, stable, and durable, and could not easily rot. So this passage compares the people of God and I want to say the families of God, the families of the children of God to the cedar of Lebanon. When you think about the cedar, think about its strength and durability. When you think about the palm, think about its majestic towering in the middle of the desert, alone in the midst of nowhere. So the picture here is that of a flourishing, majestic stand down in the desert of troubled marriages. Yeah? In the midst of a desert of troubled marriages and families. Picture this family of God standing like the cedar of Lebanon and standing like the palm tree but also think about the, the fleeting nature of marriages. When I was here, I think in the 90s, they used to say 70% of marriages in this country end up in divorce. I don't know where they are right now. I have been gone for too long. I left here in 2004. So I think you probably have the latest um, statistics. But I want to pray as I come to bless you this morning that your families, that our families will stand majestic like a palm tree. That our families will be durable and endure so much by the grace of God in the midst of deserts of loneliness and fleeting relationships that are so troubled in the world we live in. The second uh, point I have there is that these are the people of God. These are flourishing families of the children of God. Where are they located? Their place. Their place. Diaspora can be a place of religious dislocation. And many families can resort to destructive. I think you know it, I would not like to list them. Alternatives to the house of God. And I want to ask you your question today, and I know this is a rhetorical question because you are in church, but sometimes we take charge occasionally. Maybe you come once in a month, and then you're gone for another, until the next Christmas or whatever. Where do you raise your families? Family, families that are built on the Lord's foundation of love last. They will last. They will endure. They have durability families that are founded in the love of Christ. We live in a world of great turbulence, and it is only God who can hold families together. He is the hope of the family. The language here is that of the righteous. 
Families need to be rooted somewhere. In a country like this, it is easy to feel dislocated and belong to nowhere. It is the church, the house of God, that is the only place of security. And that's why I'm saying that location, that place where you, you hem the values, you form the values of your children and your family. We were here with my family. In fact, they came back for another five years with uh, the children and the mother, and they stayed in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And there is nothing comparable to having the fellowship of believers, being together with the church and raising the children in church. There are families that fill their homes with all kinds of literature. It used to be literature. Now we have all kinds of gadgets that are delivering all kinds of nonsense into our family uh, rooms. My prayer and my hope right here in the diaspora is that you will locate your place of love. Remember that scripture says those that are planted, planted in the house of God, planted in the church, connected with the church fellowship. There is nothing comparable to that. There are things that I begin to see now in my children. One of my children, uh, Sharon, I was very happy to see the healer singing wonderfully here with the mother. That is the best way to raise the healer and Shekinah and the others like them in the church. So I see my daughter singing this morning at Karen AGC, and I'm like, God, I thank you. That she's just graduated from Seattle Pacific, one of the most postmodern cities in this country. But she has been able to hold our values because of taking her to Sunday school, raising her in church that early, rooting your family in the church. And I want to say it, it's not just coming to church on Sunday. Every available opportunity from these pastors that it allows your children to have opportunity to, to learn the word of God, take them there. Take them there. Every, flood them with the things of God. Because these souls, these young souls, there are many things that are fighting for that young soul. To be able to receive sap, food, water, protection, to grow and to bloom and bear fruit, we need roots. And those roots have to be in the house of God. I think uh, Dr. Barra, remember, I used to share this. I, actually, I, I got this text the first time more clearly when I was in Moy High School, Kabarak, as an A-level student. And it was Dr. Kaleli, actually, the, who was a chaplain, Later on, the provost, I took over from him a number of years because he had mentored us so well in high school. And he used to tell us, if God wants to make you to be anything, you do not need to be uprooted from the house of God to be made that thing outside. And, you know, the high school boys and girls with all kinds of energy running through you and passions, yeah, love and all kinds of things. Kaleli told us, if God wants you to be a millionaire, he will make you a millionaire at the altar of God. If God wants to make you to be, and I appreciate the, the multi, multi, multiple professionals here honoring God at this altar this morning with the works of their hands. That is beautiful. And I was so happy, actually. Yesterday we dedicated a home you know, it's, it's the only home, I could only see in the Muzungu homes when I was here, or owned by the Wazungus. Yesterday, Catherine Miano and her husband, they are killing my children, they were with my family in, uh, in, in Pittsburgh. And I was like, wow, this is diaspora in another way I had never known. But if God wants you to own multi-million homes, God wants you to own whatever, he, you do not need to be uprooted from the house of God to be made, to be given that thing outside. So the chaplain said, God wants you to, to marry the best woman on, 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 in the world. He will give to you that woman, young man, right at the church. And also young woman will give you that young man right at the altar of God. If God wants you to raise, and I understand politicians normally come through here, 
God can raise you even to be a president. God can raise you to be a towering leader in this world. You do not need. You know, many people think that you have to be compromised. But I believe you do not need to be uprooted. That's why I say this scripture captured my heart. And I felt it is very relevant to where you are. That today, as you seek in this land of opportunity to make all kinds of things, marry, uh, buy, sell, you know, whatever you're doing, as you seek to raise your family, you do not need to be uprooted from the house of God to do that outside. There are many lives that have been, that have been shipwrecked as a result of that. And I want to be gracious to you because I do not know where people are. You could be having a very troubled marriage as I speak to you and you're like, you know, Bishop, that, that message is, is very idealistic. It's only for men who, and, and women who are okay in their family. Look, God is not done with you yet. God can still turn your life around. Amen? God, God is a God of hope. And he can still root you in the church and redefine your marriage. You know, some of the men who God used in an amazing way in the yesteryears had very troubled marriages. But once God touched that life and sanctified that life, that life became a fireball for the gospel. We actually read about them today in church history. Psalm 84 verse 3. Even the sparrow has found a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may have her young. A place near your altar, Lord Almighty. My King and my God. I love that text. That, that somewhere near the altar of God. In fact, as you read Psalm 84, you find even the bats have somewhere around the household of God. Sometimes I'm like, you know, the children of God don't know where to raise their young ones. And yet the bats know a peaceful place around the, around the sanctuary and they build their nest around there. I want to say, God help you diasporic men and women who are here to build your family around and many nests around this place, around the house of God. That's a place of safety. That's your location. Number three is uh, their prosperity. And I think uh, this morning you've exemplified the prosperity of the people of God so well. The Bible uses a Hebrew word, rahanon, raha known, meaning flourishing, in the original text of verse number 14 of Psalm 92. It means to be green, to be fresh, to be luxuriant, full of leaves, growing profusely. It is, my friends, more than just survival. You know, there are many people you meet and they tell you we're just surviving. We're just surviving in this marriage. We're just trying to leave and get by because for the sake of children. Look, a bishop from uh, the villages in Kenya has come to tell us to say, your marriage, your life can flourish, can do more than just survival. The intention of God. The Bible says here, they that will be planted will flourish in the courts of our God. It is every intention of our God. Not to let you suffer and go through survival, through life. He wants you to be the best individually, but also collectively and as a family. Amen? Amen. Flourishing. And there are many texts throughout the Bible that talks about how our families can flourish. Yeah? Psalm 1.1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of, of, of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither. And whatever he does shall prosper. Amen? Amen? That's the blessing of a man. And, I, and when I say a man, it's also inclusive of a woman. 
There are many women who have redeemed their homes because they have planted their families, their lives, right by the rivers where they drive, where they, they receive this wonderful water and their leaves never go dry. Amen? Psalm 128 says, Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. When you eat the labor of your hands, and the men and women who are here are eating the labors of their hands. What a blessing. You shall be happy, and it shall be well with you. Your wife shall be like a fruitful vine in the very heart of your house. Your children like only plants all around your table. Amen? You know, a wife, you know, it's compared to a tree growing in the house. We, you know, a tree growing in the house. Even the children are only shoots. It is a sign of prosperity. It is a sign of blessings. That that's what happens. People are rooted in the house of God. Amen? And I, I want to say here, ladies, when you marry a man who was meant to be somebody, please make them to be somebody. Amen? You know, there are women who, they find a man with a destiny. You know, they, then they forget that there is this Proverbs 31 woman who said when that man emerges among the elders of the village and take a seat at the gates, he sits with dignity. There are men who are meant to be somebody, but they couldn't be somebody because an evil woman was, sorry women, But I, but I also want to turn the plate around. All right? There are women who are meant to lead and do amazing things in this world. And then they married some, I don't know what to call them, and, and they have subjugated them to kitchen and, and all kitchen affairs. Not in a productive way. I remember one of my most difficult decisions I had to make I had just been invited back home to be the bishop of AGC Kenya. My wife wanted to come and do her doctorate. I was a very big family debate. And, uh, and I finally came to this reconciliation and harmonization by saying, it is not more important for me to be the bishop, however important that position may be, of Africa Gospel Church Kenya, than for my wife to complete her doctorate. And so we decided, and I personally as a man, decided we will, do, we will actually take on both. For nearly seven years, I was hustling between Kenya and United States and never let go of the leadership of the church. We actually have done, the man knows, we've done amazing things in terms of driving the denomination in some amazing direction. But we never let go of the family. My wife, Jane, is now Dr. Jane Langat with a PhD from Duquesne University, one of the best universities, uh, Catholic universities in, in this world. And she's currently teaching as a lecturer at Cabral University, as well as the president appointed her early this year as the chairperson of Women Enterprise um, Fund Advisory Board. She's having the nation. Whatever I said, I am a man. And the woman must always be there to cook for me. Hello? One of them is here. I got a hold of women. I don't want them to shushi. I don't want them to bring you down. I want them to build you up so that the man you married can sit among the elders. But also so that the woman you married that was destined for great things is able to achieve that which God intended. It's not easy. There will be conflicts. There will be tensions. Uh, those, the things I'm telling you, you know, it's so idealistic from the pulpit, isn't it? But, you know, there's nothing so beautiful with the woman you love when you struggle with her and you finally get that thing and you know it belongs to us. Wow. Amen? Amen? It is ours as a family. <laughs> you struggle, you cried, but you have reached the end. So I'm talking about families that prosper. Lastly, 
Uh, I don't want to, uh, you know I'm Kenyan, you better stand my friend, when it's time to go home. Your people are going to be here until tomorrow. Um, <laughs> you remember that scripture said that uh, Psalm 92, we're still in Psalm 92, planted in the house of the Lord, they will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still bear fruit in old age. They will stay fresh and green, proclaiming. Proclaiming the Lord is upright. He is my rock, and there is no wickedness in him. This gives me an opportunity to speak to you here about the whole intention. The people of God, the righteous, they are rooted in the house of God, and they prosper. In every imaginable way, spiritually, intellectually, socially, and um, economically. But more importantly, we are children of God on a mission. We are proclaimers of the kingdom of God. In fact, if there is something that is beginning to endear to me about the diaspora, because I'm, I was a traditionalist. Part of the reason why I told this guy he couldn't come. I, I went back myself after getting my doctorate from Drew University in 2004. And I have always been a believer that everyone who went to the United States must come back home. It, it is a moral responsibility. You know, you have a calling. You came to study to go back. But my mind is beginning to shift. And I think it's been becoming more rapidly over this weekend. <laughs> I have stayed here. That we are on a mission. It doesn't matter where we are. Our families are intended to proclaim the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And if there is any reason why we should be here and we'll be all over the world, is that we must proclaim the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says to declare that the Lord is upright. But as you read throughout the, the, the Bible, actually, whether it is in the Old Testament or New Testament, you will discover one thing. That God has always been ministering to and missioning communities of individuals who are, in sojourn who are sojourners in foreign lands. And I can tell you story after story after story of great men in the, in, the, in the Bible. That God walked them up from their homeland, and women as well. There were women like Esther. She was not home when she flourished. There are men like Joseph that at every angle of his life, including in Potiphar's house in a foreign land, including in prison in a foreign land, the Bible reminds us, and God was with Joseph. In fact, the Egyptians could see that in this man, isn't it the Pharaoh who said, Where do we get a man like this? It was not their own, his father or his own pastor back at home. It was a foreign king who realized there is something special. And Daniel is another one. And then another one. And then another one. And then another, all through the Old Testament. There is something about how God, in our dislocated locations where we are in the world, begins when we allow ourselves to be used of him, to use us to proclaim the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So I, I want to bless you. And I want to bless you to be proclaimers of good news. Yes? That as you stay in this land, stay very well. You know, uh, yesterday I said... Um, <clears throat> Jeremiah told the children of Israel, and I'm wondering if you are 70 years old, and he's saying, this guy is saying, you will be here for 70 years, and then God will come back for you. And he told them, settle down, and, 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 and get children, and not just get children, let your children be married, because he knew they were going to be there for long. So that is also what I'm telling this diaspora, Unless the Lord has something compelling for you and you have conviction like myself to be back in Kenya or wherever in Africa, stay and marry and get children and let your children be married off. 
No, by the time they grow up until they marry, you know, it's so many years, isn't it? But let them be flourishing families and proclaim the goodness of the Lord. The church in the New Testament was a diasporic church in every sense of the word. Yeah? If you listen to the, read the letters of Paul, Galatians, Romans, those who are not in Jerusalem, they were in foreign lands. And there were many people who were scattered in those foreign lands. Some were in business, like Priscilla and the others, those, who, those of you who were here this morning. But wherever they were, they showed themselves as aliens to declare the goodness of the Lord. Uh, four words I wanted to leave with you from that text that you are the people of God and you have a place in the house of God and you prosper in the house of God and you proclaim the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. So let me pray for you. Let's, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you this morning and this afternoon for your goodness. These people, I do not know where they are, God. Jesus, I know you love each one of them. I don't know how their families are doing. I don't know how well with their souls. But Father, I pray that somehow this word, which you've reminded us that when we are planted in the house of God, the only place we can flourish is within your courts. And we flourish so that for generations we may declare your good news. Yes. And I want to pray you bless all the families, Lord. Mm -hmm. Where there is an healthy situation in relationship, restore these families to you. Where there are challenges of every kind, economic, social, and emotional, where there are issues with children, mm -hmm. Lord, I pray that you may bring back children to obedience. Mm -hmm. and that parents may be able to raise them in the house of God. Mm -hmm. May the house of God be so dear to them that nothing will ever remove them from the house of God. Bless the pastor. I want to bless Reverend Meshach and Catherine and the pastors who serve them alongside them here at Upendo Baptist Church. Use them, not only in this church, but in the city of Dallas and even beyond in the state of Texas. May their sojourn in this land bring a lot of a transformation to many lives, restoration of many families, and many people may come to know you, Jesus, as their Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. What a blessing. What a blessing. Bishop, I want to invite you to come over here so that, uh, Pastor Luke, please come over. We want to, uh, Bishop Langati is also, um, uh, the director, uh, the chairman for uh, our hospital, the largest mission hospital probably in Africa. That is, um, those of you who have had in Bomet, a hospital called Tenwick Hospital. Some of you are medical professions. If you're thinking of a time to go for missions outreach and just to go out and, and reach out in missions, uh, consider talking to us. We can make connections for you. Those of you who go back home and you want to offer uh, Tenwick Hospital, amazing facilities. You can go there and even volunteer your services while you're still home and just work. They really benefit from Christian doctors and practitioners. Or some of you who are professional uh, educators, uh, teachers, uh, uh, he's the chancellor of uh, the Christian University, Kenya Highlands uh, University. That also uh, was our Bible school, Kenya Highlands Bible School, where most of us uh, have come from, including our sister, Monica Kirui. Monica Kirui, you should be ready to receive your senior. I think Biro was your senior. Hey, Monica, can you stand? B uh, B uh, 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 Brother Philip is like, where is this lady? <laughs> she was your junior. Oh, she was your daughter in college. Make sure she takes care of you well today after this. <laughs> so what an honor. So we were actually um, in the same university together, the Kenya Highlands uh, University. So as you remember and pray for Bishop Langat, he is also the current, currently the Vice Chair of Evangelical Alliance of Kenya. And those are the, uh, uh, I mean, the, the body that brings all the evangelical churches together in Kenya. And uh, currently also assisting that. And of course, other assignments that God has used them behind the scenes, some of you may not know.
to make sure that things are in order in our country. Are speaking to our leaders in different platforms. And therefore, we want to commit him to God in prayer. He's actually here doing denomination work. He's going to be around for the next four weeks, moving from one place to the other. Uh, so as he travels, I'll be seeing him off on Tuesday. As he travels and as he sees the work of God across this and meeting more diaspora community, that the Lord will continue speaking um, uh, to his heart on how they can partner with people like us and you to make sure that the gospel of Jesus Christ is proclaimed. So before Pastor Luke presents our, our pastor to the Lord in prayer, our bishop to the Lord in prayer, remember what Bishop has said. Can you say people, place, prosperity, proclamation. Now you see where I got my skills for preaching. Go back again. Did you hear? <laughs> Can you say people? So remember that you are people established of God. So never forget that. Can you say place? So God has given you a particular place and assignment that you should. Of course, you remember the message I preached some time ago. Can you say prosperity? It is God's desire that you are established and rooted wherever you are. Not just surviving. Not just being a hustler. But beyond a hustler. Uh, not just a survivor. But somebody who is striving in what God has done. And then can you say proclamation? We have the obligation. You remember our word here in uh, UBC? You have the obligation for each of us to tell the story wherever you are. Tell the story of Jesus at work. Tell the story of Jesus with your business. Today as we are taking our mandazi, I want you to appreciate the works of those people here. The businesses they do. Congratulate them. Support them. Because you know what? We need one another. But tell the story of God God is doing. So in that, I want us to commit the servant of God in prayer and just to appreciate uh, this moment. And uh, to represent the ladies, Mama Kimbo, please come over here. She's our ladies um, representative. Uh, as you see, Mama Kimbo, she's single, saved, and searching. Today, Leon, I'm going to advertise. Leon, I'm going advertise. Or should I say single, saved, and satisfied? <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome. So please, why don't you uh, just present God? Judge, can we all stand? Okay, let's pray. Father Lord, we come before you. We want to commit our bishop before you. As he visits, as he spreads your word, you know what he is doing in Kenya. Lord, we want to commit him. We want to commit his family. Lord Jesus, continue to be with him as you have brought him here, as he plans to move around. Lord, I know he has good things for your people. Lord, continue to use him for your glory. How we commit him right now that as he moves around, Lord, keep him safe. Let him uh, use the knowledge that comes from you. Let him shine. I know it's not a shame of pro pro proclaiming your gospel because he has even taught us that wherever we are, we should shine, we should proclaim, we should progress, we should build families, but in all, we put God first. And all these other things will come to us as the Bible commands us. Lord, I want to commit him right now. Lord, that you may continue to protect him, continue to use him, and open doors for him. Lord, even as he plans and his mind is maybe now 50% of coming over, Lord, continue to give him a wise decision, Lord, because he has a lot of work to do in Kenya. He has also an impact here as he serves in the Tenwek Hospital also. We have known those of us who are coming from Kenya, we know that Tenwek has helped so many people, those who are sick. But Lord, open more doors for him. Lord, even the finances to support the, the, the hospital, Lord, you are going to provide them in your own way. Lord, I want to commit him right now, for I want to pray, trusting and believing, and everybody say, Amen. 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 Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Mama Mkimbo, Kwania Baya Kanisa, why don't you just say a vote of thanks for, on our behalf uh, to our... Uh, Bishop, we are really honored to have you. It's good to hear the other side of the story because we thought he was lying to us all this time. Finally, somebody has come and actually put to us what he's been telling us. So we believe you now. Uh, 
And we can see he got, uh, you're a great mentor. And I'm sure there's a whole lot of work. There's so many young men and women um, learning from you. The way he's going to do the same thing here. We thank God for you. And on behalf of UBC, here at Eldorade and Colorado, we say thank you. May you go with the Lord. Thank you. Asante, Mom. Um, our visitors, please. Um, uh, we have uh, our, you said, Minister of First Impressions. Hey, that's a new one, eh? Minister of First Impressions, Dr. Captain, <laughs> Brother Captain. So, Brother Captain is here. All our guests, please. Uh, Dr. Captain will take care of you. And um, uh, Sister Monica, please. Uh, Monica, uh, can we please, you can come and also lead uh, Kina Birir. Uh, so that uh, you can have some time with them, but also uh, the family of Akana Bishop. Uh, uh, we just to appreciate the moments together. Let's enjoy our time together. And remember today, we are appreciating the people who labor and work in our midst. So before I release you, why can't we make that one more confession again? Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. Can we make that confession before that? Savior, Savior, While you are ministering, while you are touching, while you are changing, do not pass us by. And so I commit your people before you, God. The Father, in this place that you have brought them, they shall prosper to the extent that they will proclaim the gospel of Christ. Father, we bring your people before you today. And I speak this words on you as people of God. And that the Lord will establish you as a people of God to be, to prosper in this place. And as you prosper in this place, I pray that the Lord will remind you that the reason for that prosperity is for you to proclaim the gospel. And so I speak these words on you in the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the church said, and now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Greet the greetable, hug the huggable, shake the shakeable, tell them Jesus lives